What's up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC 265. We have the interim title fight between Cyril Gon going against Derek Lewis, a uh, main event that I'm definitely looking forward to. You have the uh, you have the fan favorite in Derek Lewis, and you have a, a young in terms of like heavyweight up and comer and Cyril Gon who has just you know cruised his way to a, a dang title shot. Like this is a guy that's been in the UFC for what two three years. And is already, you know, fighting for an interim belt. So um, should be a fun fight there. We have the co-main event, Jose Aldo going against Pedro Munoz. A fight I'm looking forward to see. Of uh, Vicente Luque, uh, Michael Chiesa on the on the main card as well. Personally, my favorite fight of the night right there. Um, Song Yadon, Casey Kenny, like Rafael Fizia, Bobby Green. Like this card's decent. This card's pretty decent. Not the best, you know, pay-per-view in the world. But uh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And as always, it's another opportunity to make some money. And definitely bounce back from a disaster of, of last week. The picks were not great. Looking to definitely bounce back here and unlike last week this card's uh, pretty dang good so looking forward to that um, it is the first of the month that does mean I'm going to shout out the patron here um, if you guys can sign up that would be much much appreciated it really does help me I'm um, really does go a long way the most popular option is going to be that UFC betting tier it is ten dollars a month or you know basically two dollars and fifty cents per week with that you get access to uh, the UFC statistical model courtesy of Uncle Weezy he also does an awesome matchup template as well uh, you get first notice on all the bets which by the way I do have six bets right now and looking at uh, a couple more actually it's gonna be a pretty big card for me in terms of the action um the betting article the betting breakdown video um hail mary parlay access to discord tons and tons of info there if you do play dfs i have a dfs package as well but um all the support there goes a long way it allows me to do this full time and put 100 percent of my time and effort into everything i do um looking to have a, a good august went back and, and looked at july and had a, a profitable july and you know they couldn't really complain i mean july was fine outside of of, you know, last week's card wasn't great, and then the Kyler Phillips, situa Kyler Phillips situation. But other than that, profitable July, looking to make a, a profitable August, and starting with this card right here, that'd be sweet. Um, and it also, since it is a pay per view, going to do the contest as usual. We'll give away some free money here. I've given away like over, probably over like fifteen hundred dollars. Um, now I've been doing these contests for what well over a year now. Um, the first one's going to be the significant strike contest. Um, to enter the contest, first leave a like on the video. Second, subscribe if you have not yet. And then third, comment down how many significant strikes you think that Cyril Gon and Derek Lewis are going to combine for. Kind of a, a tough main event for this, but whoever gets the closest gets 25, 20, I believe it, $25. Yeah, we'll do $25 um, for the guy that's closest. If there's a tie, it's going to be the person that did comment um, first there. As far as the DK contest, to enter that, first leave a like on the video, of course, and subscribe if you have not yet, and then comment down your DraftKings username. I can get up to 200 people in that contest. Again, $25 to first place as well. All right, I do want to point out going live on Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, as always. Um, can't wait to see the weigh-ins for some of these fights. Uh, and then also going live on Saturday, one hour prior to the prelims as well. And if we can get 500 likes on this video, that'd be awesome. You guys have been killing the likes as always. Last pay-per-view, we like smashed the likes. We got, I think, like over 800 likes. Um, let's aim for 500. Let's aim for 500 this week, maybe 600. That'd be cool, but I um, really do appreciate the support. support. It really does go a long way. So with all that out of the way, I said we break down some fights. I said we break down some fights, and we're going to start with the first fight of the night, a fight that I am definitely looking forward to. We have Johnny Munoz Jr. going against Jamie Simmons. We have uh, Munoz Jr., who is 28 years old, 5'9", 71-inch reach, 10-1, and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. Jamie Simmons, he is 28 years old, 5'6". Uh, 70 inch reach, 7 and 3, and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. So we will take a look at the odds here. And we have Jamie Simmons opening up as a plus 130 dog, currently plus 220. Um, Johnny Munoz opening up as a minus 150 favorite, currently minus 260. So, yeah, a lot of money coming in on the Johnny Munoz side, and I completely agree with it. Johnny Munoz made his UFC debut against Nate Maness. I believe it was on short notice. It was up a weight class. He's now going to be back at his normal weight class here, and I thought he made a really good account for himself. I thought he looked good. I, I personally scored the fight for him as well, and um, you take a look at it. He had 9 minutes and 42 seconds of control time in that fight. He was 2 for 16 on takedowns, but remind you, he did come in on short notice. He was up a weight class, so really no shame in that. And Nate Maness is a pretty solid fighter. Um, he did outland Nate Maness in all three rounds in terms of the significant strikes. First round, he outlanded Maness 19 to 2. Second round, he outlanded Maness 14 to 10. Third round, he outlanded Maness 16 to 9. 
Um, but the reason he lost was because um, he kicked Maness and in the nuts like five times. The ref took a point, and I believe even with like the nut shot though, he would have lost. Yeah, 29, 27 on all three judges' scorecards. Um, and even with the nut shot, I personally scored it like a draw at the very worst. I thought he won most of those rounds there. So, um, but either way, he made a very good account for himself. Cannot really say the same thing against Jamie Simmons, but you know how can you blame him? They brought him in to give Jika Jakadze his first UFC finish. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Giga finished him in the first round, as everyone expected. I, I think I cashed a, a Giga first round knockout ticket in that fight, and rightfully so. But Munoz, I, I like this guy a lot. I think he's very, very good. He is a black belt in BJJ, a, le a legit grappler. I went back and watched tape on this guy, and there was a fight where it, my, my jaw dropped. That's how impressed I was. He went from a, like an arm bar to a triangle, right back into an arm bar to getting a finish in the matter of like five seconds. Like he is slick on the mat to say the least uh jamie simmons what does he want to do in his fights he, he wants to get the fight down to the mat um he has knocked out some bums on the feet standing but the more majority of his fights he's going out there you know picking guys up slamming them jamie simmons is a very good wrestler it's just you know will he want to go down to the ground with with johnny Munoz jr i just I, I don't really i don't really think so um jamie simmons he is a blue belt in bjj um he does have some submissions on his record but you got to think that johnny Munoz is going to have a a significant grappling advantage to say the least you know even like the striking like i'm not impressed with jamie him in striking whatsoever i honestly favor munus in the striking believe it or not um i just think munus is pretty much better everywhere i think he's the better fighter i, I don't think jamie simmons should be in the ufc um jamie simmons has been finishing all three of his losses two by knockout one by submission kind of a killer be killed fighter and i do think munus does get it done here i think it does get it done early as well i think whether it's jamie simmons taking down munus maybe a sub on his back or even I think Munoz goes out here and takes him down gets on top and either finds a sub or gets a ground and pound finish but yeah I'll go Johnny Munoz here and I'll take him to win by first round submission I like this guy a ton I think he's very very skilled and I do think he gets his first UFC win here on UFC 265 all right Next, we have Melissa Gatto going against Victoria Leonardo. We have Melissa Gatto, 25 years old, 5'5", five 6'0-2", five, um, oh and 3'0-2 and oh and in her last five fights, which I, I really think she should not be undefeated. I went back and watched her, her very um, last draw, which, by the way, was a long time ago. It was three years ago against City Rocha. I went back and watched that fight, and she literally lost, like, every second of that fight pretty much i mean she was on her back for like 15 minutes of that fight um she threw up a couple submissions but none of them were really close and they scored a, a draw for some reason so i don't know what happened there but regardless um she should not be 6-0 in my opinion whatsoever but we have uh, Victoria Leonardo, who is 31 years old. She's going to be six years older, five foot five as well, with a 64 inch reach. She is eight and three, and three and two in her last five fights. Her last loss was to Manon Fioro. No shame in that. Manon Fioro is definitely somebody to watch out for in the division. So. The big story here with Gatto is she's coming off a of PED suspension. We have not seen her in, what, two years and nine months. And this is why she's the favorite right there. You see it. She beat Carol Rosa by submission. Um, Carol Rosa is obviously having some success in the UFC. Hence why I, I do think Gatto is the favorite. Because, man, there are so many question marks on her. There are so many question marks on this fight. I would not recommend betting this fight. Uh, but we do see that Gatto has opened up as a minus 110 pick -em. She went down to, like, minus 155. She's now back to minus 117. Team. Um, Victoria Leonardo opened up, you know, pick them. Um, she went all the way up to one uh, plus 120. She's now down to minus 103. So the line is closing. I probably do expect it to be a pick them by fight time because it probably should. Like, we do not know much about Melissa Goddard. I was able to watch like four or five fights, and from what I've seen, like, well, I didn't, I didn't see any striking, so I don't know how good her striking is. I will say that she has no takedown defense. She's content to lay on our back for 15 minutes if need be, um, but she's very, very good on the match. She has great submissions, um, but I think she's kind of sub or bust, so seeing her as a favorite, I, I, I do see why the line is kind of you know closing in because I, I do really think she's sub or bust, and, and yeah, it could happen, um, but her, her path to victory is pretty much an, an arm bar from guard. Um, so Victoria Leonardo, she's somebody I'll definitely fade in the future. Um, I played Mano Fioro against her pretty heavy here. I'm not all that heavy on her, but um, shout out to Uncle Weezy. He pointed this out on our show we did Sunday. Um, Victoria Leonardo, Leonardo has 11 fights since the last time Melissa Gatto has fought. 11 fights so she's very active um you know she's 31 years old 
she's okay. <laughs> she's okay, but I think she has what it takes to win this fight. I, I don't know what the striking is going to look like. I'm going to guess Victoria Leonardo is the better striker. Um, I think Victoria Leonardo can also get takedowns at will. It's just she needs to get on top and stay very, very safe. So I think it's a very winnable matchup for Victoria Leonardo. I will pick her to win. I'll pick her to win by decision. But honestly, this has armbar from guard written all over it. A ton of question marks on the Gatto side. And I would tread very, very lightly. So I will take Leonardo, though, as a dog. But uh, a fight I'm definitely staying far away from. All right, a fight we were supposed to see a few weeks ago. A fight that I did have a bet on Miles Johns, but I got him at minus 170. And it kind of sucks because they now adjusted the line. And we now see Miles Johns at minus 200. And we now see Anderson Dos Santos at plus 170. So I got completely screwed. But, you know, I still do like Miles Johns in this fight. So um, I do want to get into some stats for this fight as I do think they're important. But we do have Miles Johns, who is 27 years old, 5'7". 68 inch reach, 11 and 1, and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Anderson Dos Santos, 36 years old. A 36 year old bantamweight here. He is 5 foot 5 with a 70 inch reach, 21 and 8, and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Yeah, 36 year old bantamweight in Dos Santos who has taken a ton of damage throughout his career. I'm going against a young Miles Johns, you know, in his prime or just about getting there, training at a very good camp in Fortis MMA. You know, we're seeing, you know, improvements like leaps and bounds. Every time we see Miles Johns um, fight, we're seeing improvements in that striking. He has that wrestling background. Miles Johns was a state champion wrestler. I believe he went to college for wrestling as well. And you can definitely see it, and we'll kind of get into this stats here so as far as the striking goes miles johns does land 3.33 significant strikes per minute with a 48 percent accuracy um, absorbs 2.42 with a positive significant strike differential of 0.91 and a 68 percent striking defense very solid numbers they're not the most volume in the world but his striking is uh pretty solid and getting better uh, anderson dos santos on the other hand does land you know 2.66 significant strikes per minute with a 28 percent takedown or 28 percent striking accuracy absorbing a massive 4.8 significant strikes per minute with a negative 2.14 significant strike differential minus 2.14 differential that is terrible and a 55 percent striking defense kind of a punching bag out there but he's dangerous he's very dangerous and if you can't get this down to the mat i do think i'll have success i just think that's going to be easier said than done here against johns who has an 87 percent takedown defense anderson dos santos has a 18 percent takedown accuracy he does average 1.3 takedowns for 15 minutes um, Miles Johns does average 1.21 with 30% accuracy himself. I just don't know if Miles Johns is going to want to go down to the mat with Anderson Osantos, who is very, very dangerous. As far as the finish stats, yeah, like I said, Anderson Osantos, I don't think he's great. I think he's getting up there in age. But what I will say is he goes, he goes after it. He goes for the finish, kind of a killer be killed fighter. 81% finish rate, 57% by submission. So if this fight does hit the mat, he's going to be very, very live. I just think that Johns is going to, you know, use that takedown defense, use that wrestling background, stuff the takedowns, keep it on the feet, don't go to the mat with this guy, um, and outstrike him for three rounds. I, I really do believe that Miles Johns, if he fights smart, I think he can outstrike him, you know, clearly in a, in a three-round fight, three-round decision, and maybe even get a finish as well. Anderson Dos Santos has been knocked out three times. He has been submitted twice as well. Miles Johns has been knocked out and has only lost. So... I'm actually going to take Miles Johns by knockout here. I'll take him to win by second round knockout. I think it's a, a good opportunity to, to, win, to win a fight here. And, and you guys can probably see why I, I did bet on this guy at minus 170. I'm going to kind of wait and see where that line goes. I'm hoping it comes down. Um, last time they fought, it did go down to like minus 150 for some reason. I'm hoping that happens again. I will jump back on. But as now, um, I'm not going to lay minus 200 on Miles Johns because Anderson Santos is very dangerous. But I do think Miles Johns has a, a ton of advantages in this fight, to be honest. So I'll take Miles Johns. I'll take him to win by second round knockout. Um, should be a very, very good fight. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention is. Um, Anderson Dos Santos, I believe he's one in two in the UFC, and that one win has came against Martin Day, who went 0-5 between UFC and Contender Series combined. Um, so definitely not a great look there, to be honest. So give me Miles Johns, um, and give me Miles Johns by second round knockout. All right, this is going to be an absolute banger. I'm so excited for this fight. Manel Kopp going against Odie Osborne. Um, you have Kopp, who is 27 years old, five foot five with a 68 inch reach. Uh, 15 and 6 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Odie Osborne, 29 years old, 5 foot 7, 72 inch reach, 9 and 3, and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. So, something very, very interesting and important to note is going to be that Odie Osborne is actually cutting down weight. Um, his last fight was at 145 against Jerome Rivera, 
And this fight's going to be at 125. And I went through his career, and this is actually going to be his very first fight at flyweight, which is crazy because you take a look at this guy, and he's huge. He's going to be huge flyweight if he does make the weight. 5'7", 72-inch reach. Um, I'm very curious to see this guy on the scales. Like It's going to be this first time in his career, including amateurs, um, where he is cutting down to flyweight. So something very important to mention there. So um, definitely want to you know see him at the weigh-ins for sure. Um, Manel Kopp. He is coming off of a two-fight losing streak. We'll talk about that in a little bit. First, I want to get to the odds real quick, quick, and we will see that Manel Kopp opened up minus 200, currently minus 180. Odie Osborne is plus 155, opened up plus 170. So some money is coming in on Odie Osborne. I do think he'll be one of the more popular plays on the entire card just because of how, how unimpressive Manel Kopp has been. So Manel Kopp comes into the UFC with a ton of hype. Everybody's on this guy. Um, I actually bet Alexander Pantoja against him, um, and he just didn't do anything in that fight. He did a lot of dancing around. Uh, I made a tweet joking around saying, like, if this was a dance-off, he would have won the fight. But, you know, Pantoja, you know, beat him clearly for three rounds. Um, and then he goes against Mateus Nicolau. I had a, a bet on Mateus Nicolau as well as a, as a slight dog, and a lot of people thought that Cop won. It was a very, very close fight. I personally scored it for Mateus Nicolau, um, not because I had a bet on him, but it was a close fight. A lot of people thought that Cop won, um, but it could have went either way. So what I'm trying to get at is, look at who he's facing. Alexander Pantoja and Mateus Nicolau, two guys that are very good, very, very good. And now he's taking a step down here against Odie Osborne, who comes into the UFC and gets submitted by gatekeeper Brian Kelleher in the first round in 2 minutes and 49 seconds, and then goes out there and knocks out what could be the worst UFC fighter in history in Jerome Rivera. I think it was like the very first punch he landed. He knocks out Jerome Rivera. Um, so it's a big step up in competition for Osborne. Like You can have have a bigger step up in competition going from Jerome Rivera to Manel Cop. And um, I went through, I watched the tape on Osborne, He's good. He's good. He's very dangerous. Both these guys are very, very dangerous. Uh, Manel Kopp, a 93% finish rate. Um, Osborne, a 88% finish rate. Kopp finishing 60% of his wins by knockout. Osborne finishing um, 44% by knockout and 44% by submission as well. Both guys have been submitted twice. Both guys have never been knocked out. Um, you take a look at Osborne, and I don't think he's been out of the first round in like his last seven or eight fights. So I'm really curious to see what happens if this fight does get extended. I also look to see if Osborne does wrestle offensively. And you know, I've watched a good like five, six, seven fights, and I didn't see him shoot for one takedown. Um, I've seen him get taken down a ton of times. I think his takedown defense is, is pretty horrible, but he has the ground game to back it up. He's more than comfortable off his back. He has triangles, arm bars, um, and he's very dangerous off his back. So I think Cop can mix it up. I think Cop can 100% get takedowns if he wants them, um, but he's got to be very, very careful off the mat because Osborne is is very, very live on his back for sure. Um, on the feet, I do favor Cop. Osborne does have some power himself. He does have a reach advantage, but Cop's going to be much faster. I don't love the volume, but man, you're, you've lost two fights in the UFC. You got to think he's going to come out and he's going to fight with some urgency, like unlike he has in the last couple fights. But you know, Cop for a for a flyweight. This guy hits like an absolute truck. Um, he has so many finishes on his record, and it's not, he has a, a big sample size 15 wins. He has 15 wins. I believe he's finished like 14 out of 15 wins. So this guy is very dangerous, has a ton of power. Um, it's a good fight. It's a very good fight. I think someone's getting finished here. I'm actually going to take Cop. I'm going to take Cop to win by second round finish. I think he's going to survive that early storm of Osborne. I think he's going to turn on that second round and get a knockout. I'm looking forward to this fight so much. It's going to be maybe fight of the night. I think it's going to be an absolute war for as long as it lasts. And I think someone's going down. And I think the person going down is Osborne there. So give me my now Cop. I'm going to take him to win by second round knockout. All right. We have Carolina Kovacavich going against Jessica Penne. We have Kovacavich, who is 35 years old, 5'3", 64-inch reach, 12-6, and six, and 1-4 and four in her last five fights. Jessica Penne, she is 38 years old, 5'5", 67-inch reach, 13-5, and five, and 2-3 and three in her last five fights. Um, but, you know, I thought he, I thought she lost her last fight against Luby Godinez. So she really could be, you know, 1-4 and four in her last five fights as well. Um, some things to point out is Jessica Penne is a 38 year old straw weight both fighters are well past their prime both fighters have been looking atrocious 
Um, but I do want to take a look at the odds here, and they are pretty close. Carolina opening up a minus 180 favorite, currently minus 122. Jessica Penny opening up a plus 155 dog, currently plus 102. So something interesting to point out is the massive layoff that Jessica Penny took prior to her loopy fight. Um, four years and two months ago, in her last legit win was six years and seven months ago against Random Marcos was her last legit win. I don't, I don't really, I don't really count this win. I mean, I really thought she lost, and a lot of people were with me on that. But her last legit win was against Random. Just think about that: six years and seven months ago. Um, crazy. Crazy, but Carolina hasn't been doing, you know, great herself. So I, I do want to get into the stats on this one, as I do think they're very important. Um, Carolina Kovacavich, very high volume, lands 5.27 significant strikes per minute with a 39% striking accuracy, but she does absorb a ton of 5.65 significant strikes absorbed with a negative 0.38 significant strike differential and a 56% striking defense. As far as Penne, even worse striking numbers to say the least. She lands very low volume, 2.4 significant strikes per minute with only a 33% accuracy, absorbing 4.4 significant strikes per minute with a negative 0.20, a negative 2.05, my bad, I'm, I'm tired, it's going to land a negative 2.05 significant strike differential and a 48% striking defense. As far as the takedown stats go, um, you're not going to see a takedown from Carolina. She only has like, I think one in her career, 12% accuracy, but Jessica Penny is going to want to get this fight down to the mat hundred percent. She does average 1.5 takedowns for 15 minutes with a 23% takedown accuracy. Uh, Carolina Kovacavich does have a 75% takedown defense. So something interesting to note is going to be that I went back and watched her fight against Michelle Watterson, and I, I forget who was announcing, but they said, you know, prior to her getting taken down by Watterson, um, that she actually had the best takedown defense um, in terms of percentage in the entire division, and that really stuck out to me. And you can take a look at it. Like, her takedown defense is, you know, pretty solid. Pretty solid takedown defense, and I think that's going to be very important here. Another thing to mention is going to be that she is training with JJ, somebody that has very good takedown defense herself. Um, I think that's that's pretty huge right there. And just basically, if she's able to keep this on the feet, I think she's going to have a ton of success. I think she's the much better striker, a ton more volume as well. Um, I guess the only thing I'm worried about is if Penny is able to get a takedown. And if she does get a takedown, she'll probably ride out the entire round. So that kind of has me a little bit concerned. But I do think that Carolina is going to win the striking and, and win it pretty uh, clearly with that volume. I think she's a better striker. She's younger as well. Uh, Jessica Penny, 38 year old straw weight. Just crazy how she's still going. But, you know, I'm going to take Carolina here. I think it's a solid matchup for her unless she's like completely, completely shot, unless she can't stuff a takedown now. Um, I think it's a, a pretty solid matchup for her, to be honest. Um, but I will take Carolina Kovacavich to win by decision. All right, next we have another banger. We have Ed Herman going against Alonzo Menafield. We have Alonzo Menafield, who is 33 years old, six foot, 76 inch reach, 10 and 2. And three and two in his last five fights. Ed Herman is 40 years old, six foot one, 75 inch reach, 25 and 14, and three and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. We have Alonzo Menafield opening up minus 140 for some reason, currently minus 235, and we have Ed Herman opening up plus 120, currently plus 200. So some money has came in on Menafield early, but we do see some money coming back on Herman as of late. So. Pretty easy fight to break down, to be honest. I mean, Ed Herman's going to want to get this fight down to the mat. I personally don't think he can. Uh, Alonzo Menafield has a very good takedown defense. He was able to stuff like 9 out of 10 takedowns against Devin Clark. His takedown defense is sitting at 85% on paper, and he's, he's very, very strong. He's very, very athletic. I really struggle to see Ed Herman getting this fight down to the mat, at least early when Menafield's fresh. If it does get extended, that's where I do have some concerns. Menafield does slow down as the fight goes on, but he's going to be very, very live to land a bomb in the first round against Ed Herman here, who you know has a 43% striking defense. So at range, Ed Herman is going to be in some serious, serious trouble because Menafield hits like an absolute truck. But yeah, kind of going through Ed Herman, um, and he, he's, he's 40 years old now, you know, he's definitely, you know, past his prime to say the least. And you kind of take it the run he's been on because he's on a three fight winning streak, but you kind of take a look at it and <laughs> Mike Rodriguez, Mike Rodriguez literally finishes him to the body. The ref says it was a, a shot to the groin. Um, he comes back and, and wins by a third round submission. After getting finished by Mike Rodriguez, Mike Rodriguez dropped him two times in that fight. Prior to that, he goes against what could be the worst fighter in UFC history. 
in Kadis Ibrahimov, somebody that's now been cut from the UFC, and he beats him by decision. Prior to that, he gets a win over Patrick Cummings um, in a fight where he got rocked a couple times early and then landed a very nice knee on Cummings, put him out there. But listen to before that, like John Volante, split decision loss, CB Dalloway loss, um, Nikita Krylov, uh, KO loss. Um, and that was back in 2016. So I'm just not impressed with his you know three-fight win streak basically because First of all, he should have lost against Mike Rodriguez. Second of all, Kadis Ibrahimov should not be in the UFC, and he's, he's currently not. So, um, But same thing with Menefield. Like, I've, I'm not really impressed with Menefield as well. He loses to Devin Clark. He loses to OSP. That was not a great look. A fight where he got out-volumed and finished in the second round. I was not expecting OSP to knock him out like that. And then it went over Fabio Chiron. But... You know, Menafield's much, much younger. He's going to be much more athletic, faster. He's going to have a, a massive power advantage as well. And I think he's going to have a ton of advantage, a ton of opportunities to find the early shot against Ed Herman. I do think he does put down Ed Herman in that first round. So I'll take Alonzo Menafield, but if it gets out of the first round, it's going to be a competitive, close, probably ugly fight. But I do think Alonzo Menafield catches him in that first round. Give me Menafield by first round knockout. All right, moving on, we have an interesting fight here. We have Draco Rodriguez going against Vince Morales. We have Rodriguez is 25 years old, 5 foot 8, 69 and a half inch reach, 7 and 2 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Going against Vince Morales who is 30 years old, 5 foot 7, 68 inch reach, 9 and 5 and 2 and 3 in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here. We have a very closely lined fight. We have Rodriguez opening up as a plus 155 dog, currently minus 115. And we have Vince Morales opening up as a minus 180 favorite, currently minus 105. So the line is, is definitely closing there. And, you know, you take a look at, at Vince Morales and, you know, what he's done throughout his career. And it was not a good look in his last fight against uh, Gutierrez. Chris Gutierrez, he absolutely destroyed his legs. But we got to kind of mention that, for one, Chris Gutierrez kicks very, very hard. Some of the best leg kicks in the division. And for two, he actually took that fight up a weight class. That fight was at um, 145. He's now back at Bantamweight, um, which is where, is where he's fought the, his entire UFC career. So some things to note there. Um, and then against Benito Lopez, the fight prior to that, I really thought he won that fight. In the first round, he dropped Benito Lopez. Um, in the second round, I thought he lost that. But the third round, he out volumes uh, Benito Lopez, out volumes him 32 to 21. Um, I thought he pretty clearly won that fight against Benitez. And then prior to that, has a decision win over Eamon Zahabi. Um, prior to that, lost a decision to Song Yadong in a fight where it was competitive. That second round and third round, they were pretty competitive. Um, and then prior to that, he, on the contender series against Domingo Pilarte, went back and watched that fight. And, man, he was a second away from finishing Domingo Pilarte. He hurt him bad in that first round. Um, you know, I wouldn't have complained if the ref stopped that whatsoever. Like, that fight was so close to being over. Um, Pilarte got saved by the bell, gets into round two. Pilarte does take down Morales, and he gives up his back right away, which I don't like that and pertains to this matchup. But um, he was very close to finishing Domingo Pilarte. As far as Draco Rodriguez, um, comes in on a contender series, gets a submission win in the first round. Um, after that, comes in, makes his UFC debut against Eamon Zahabi, and he gets knocked out in the very first round, which shocked me. I picked Zahabi in that fight, and I can tell you right now, I was not expecting him to get knocked out. And not a big sample size here, but Rodriguez does have a 26% striking defense. And if you go watch tape, you can see that this guy is very hittable. I remember watching the the Tony Gravely fight where he was getting dominated for the entire fight. Um, he gets up and he walks forward towards Gravely uh, with his hands down. Gravely just knocks him out cold. Um, so his striking defense is questionable. I think his striking is questionable, to be honest. It's not horrible, but I think I'm going to favor Vince Morales there quite a bit. And regardless, like Drake Rodriguez is going to want to get this fight down to the mat. Uh, Morales on paper does have a poor 55% takedown defense, but his get-up game is very good. A shout-out to Uncle Weezy in uh, his advanced stats that he does. Um, he's only been controlled for about 5% or 6% of the time in the UFC, which that's, that's very, very good. So although uh, Vince Morales is getting taken down, um, he's getting right back up, and I think that's very important to note here because on the feet, I think Rodriguez is going to be in very big trouble. I think his striking defense is extremely questionable. I think his chin's questionable as well, and Vince Morales is 
he has power. He's a ton of power. 56% knockout rate for Morales, a 78% finish rate overall. Rodriguez, a finisher himself, finishing 57% of his wins by submission. I think if Rodriguez does win, it will be by submission. Um, but yeah, Rodriguez has been finished in both of his losses, both by knockout. I think this is a good fight for Morales. I really do think it's a good fight for Morales. I, I like him coming back down to his normal weight class. I think he's going to have a ton of opportunities to find the chin of Rodriguez. I favor him quite a bit in the striking, and I, I will pick him here. I will pick the dog in Vince Morales to win. I will say, I'll say third round knockout. I'll say third round knockout for Vince Morales. He's somebody that you know can go a full three rounds. He's somebody that's going to be fresh in that third round and definitely does put it on. So I'll go. Uh, I'll go third round finish for Morales if uh, Rodriguez does slow down after trying to grapple with him. All right, next we have a very good fight. I believe this is the last fight before we do get on the pay-per-view main card. We have Rafael Fiziev going against um, Bobby Green. Solid fight here. Rafael Fiziev is 28 years old, 5'8", 71.5-inch reach. He is 9-1 and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. Bobby Green is 34 years old, 5'10", 71-inch reach, 27-11-1, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. So, We'll take a look at the odds here, and Fizayev is the second biggest favorite on the card right behind Cyril Gaon, and he opened up minus 145, my goodness, he's now minus 310, and Bobby Green opened up plus 125, he's now plus 250. So, yeah, I, I think that line is um, pretty disrespectful, to be honest, like Bobby Green... It seems like he always goes to to very, very close fights. And I really did think he he won his last fight against Tiago Moises in a fight where he outlands him 2-1. to one. Um, He takes him down multiple times, gets some control time, outlands him 85-42 to 42 in terms of significant strikes. I really thought Bobby Green won that fight, but they gave it to Tiago Moises. Um, before that, won against Alan Patrick, um, beat Lana Venata, beat Clay Guida. Um, prior to that, he lost to Francisco Trinaldo in a, a very, very close fight that I personally thought he won. And then he lost to Jakar Close somehow in a, in a fight that I, I definitely thought he won. So he's losing some some really close fights that he very well could have won. So he can be on a big win streak here. Um, but going against Rafael Fiziev, who this guy is legit. I love Fizayev striking. Um, he hits very hard. He mixes it up, mixes it up very well to the body, to the legs, to the head, and he hits hard. Um, prior to the UFC, actually, he finished all of his fights, but he did come into the UFC. He got knocked out in his debut, um, a, a spinning back kick um, to the head uh, by Magomed Mustafaev. After that, bounces back against Alex White and Mark Diacasey, and then gets his first knockout win against Honato Moicano. But you know, you go back and watch those fights and. You know, they're, they're somewhat competitive at times. I mean, the Alex White fight, um, he really slowed down in that fight. I don't know if he slowed down or if he kind of, like, take, took that third round off because Alex White outlanded Fizayev 27-1. to 27-1. to 1. Fizayev was able to take him down, but still, you're getting outlanded by Alex White 27-1 to 1 in that third round. Um, one of the judges did give White that third round. Um, the other judges gave the round to Fizayev. Um, but just not a good sign. And then it, same thing with Mark Diacasey. In that third round, he gets outlanded by Mark Diacasey. He gets outlanded. Um, never mind, he, he doesn't get outlanded. Uh, 32 to 29, he outlands Mark Diacasey. Um, but, but two of the judges do give him that third round there. So either way, like it's a close competitive round, third round. Second round, um, both fighters do land 28 significant strikes. So he's having competitive rounds with some of these guys and and Bobby Green is a guy that I feel like can make this fight competitive. He, Robbie Green has as good wrestling. Um Fiziev does have 100% takedown defense, but he's defending takedowns against, you know, Mark Diacasey. He's defending takedowns against Alex White. Um this is going to be the best wrestler that Fiziev has uh, fought and um I think he does stuff the majority of them, but what happens if Bobby Green does get Fiziev down? Uh, we really don't know. But from what I've seen, Fiziev's take on defense is very, very good. It's very solid. I do think that he's going to have a lot of success in rounds one and rounds two. I feel like the the it will be competitive in terms of the numbers. Bobby Green's very high volume, but you know, Fiziev's going to be landing the harder shots, um, the shots that are going the judges are going are going to look at. And we're gonna have a crowd for this card, but you're going to be able to hear some of the shots that Fiziev lands. Um, maybe he does hurt Bobby Green at some point, but Bobby Green's very durable, only has been knocked out by Dustin Poirier. And I'm going to say if Fiziev does win and, and take a, a decision here, I think he's going to win 29-28. I think like Bobby Green's going to steal one of those rounds. Um, but overall, I think the fight's going to be close. I think the fight will be close, but you got to go with Fiziev here. Um, I'll take him to win by decision. Don't think he knocks out Bobby Green. But yeah, just taking a look at the line, minus 310. It seems a little bit off to me, to say the least. So I'll go Fiziev to win rounds one and rounds two and kind of you know cruise and maybe drop that third round. 
All right, we're now going to start the main card here with a, a very good fight. I'm looking forward to this one. We have Casey Kenny going against Song Yadong. We have Kenny, 30 years old, 5'7", 68-inch reach, 16-3-1, and three and 3-2 and 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 in his last five fights. Song Yadong, 23 years old, 5'8", 67-inch reach, 16-5-1, and 3-2, and and and, or 3-1-1 and one and one in his last five fights. So... Yeah, we'll take a look at the odds here before we get into it. We have a very close to the line fight, and for a really good reason, Casey Kenny opened up a plus 105 dog. He's now a slight minus 115 favorite. Um, Song Yidong opened up minus 125. He's now a slight minus 105 dog. And I do think this line should be very, very close. I mean, Song Yidong is somebody that, look, he's, he's 23 years old. He's 23 years old. He's training at a very good camp at Team Alpha Male. This is a guy that started his career... I want to say at like like 15, 15 years old, 16 years old. This is a guy that at 21, 22 years old was fighting killers like like Marlon Vera. He was fighting guys like like Cody Stamen. Like that's that's so impressive to me. And I think this guy has a has a huge ceiling. He's still so young. He still has a a whole you know career ahead of him. Um, you know, Casey Kenny is somebody that has been making massive improvements. I mean, you take a look at some of his recent fights and you compare him to fights, you know, a couple of years ago, and you see improvements, leaps and bounds in this dude striking. Like, this dude striking has gotten so much better. He's very well-rounded, great grappling, you know, great wrestling, and, and great striking now as well. I like the volume that he throws. And, you know, what it comes down to for me is I think this fight's very close. I think it's very competitive. You know, Casey Kenny's going to be throwing the more volume. Um, Song Yidong's going to be throwing the more power. Do you favor the power of Song Yidong? Do you favor the volume of Kenny? But I think, you know, Kenny being able to mix in the takedowns is what's going to win in the fight here. Uh, Kenny does average 1.10 takedowns for 15 minutes with a 39% accuracy, and Song Yidong does have a 56% takedown defense, so he can be taken down 100%. But, you know, Song Yidong does have a good get-up game. So I don't think Kenny's going to have, like, a ton of success hold in terms of holding him down but i do think he can mix up the takedowns in a very close round and and probably sneak um a close decision there so i'll go casey kenny for the win i think it's gonna be a very close fight and it's gonna go to the scorecards who knows what the judges are watching so i will take casey Casey kenny go though to uh, mix it up and win a decision all right next fight here we have angela hill going against tisha torres we have angela hill 36 years old, 5 foot 3, 64 and a half inch reach, 13 and 9, and 3 and 2 in her last five fights. Tisha Torres, she is 31 years old, 5 foot 1, 61 inch reach, 12 and 5, and 2 and 3 in her last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. We have Tisha Torres opening up plus 100, currently plus 130. We have Angela Hill opening up minus 120, currently plus 110. So the line has flipped there. So this is going to be a rematch from 2000, I want to say 2015. Um, when Tisha Torres did beat Angela Hill, and I know that fight was uh, a while ago, about six years ago, but I kind of think it's going to look, uh, you know, pretty similar. Um, you know, Angela Hill has improved her take on defense leaps and bounds since then. Um, that's something she has struggled out, struggled with throughout her career is that takedown defense. But, you know, it's been looking a lot better as of late. She's able to stuff takedowns more. I still don't think her ground game or her get-up game is, is that great. But, you know, the takedown defense is definitely improving. Um, you know, Angela Hill's probably going to have a striking advantage here. She throws a ton of volume. She's going to have a reach advantage as well. I just think Tisha Torres is going to be mix, able to mix in those takedowns. You take a look at Angela Hill. She has been taken down at least once in her last four fights. Uh, takedowns against Luma Luke Bumi. Um, takedowns against Claudia Gadelia in a fight where Claudia got her down in the first round and completely ab abandoned uh, the takedown game after that. And then uh, this was impressive. Against Michelle Waterson, she did stuff um, a ton. She stuffed 17 takedowns. 17 takedowns were stuffed against Michelle Waterson. Waterson was able to get her down once. Um, when she did get her down, she was able to control her for long periods of time there. And then just recently, um, Ashley Yoder. Ashley Yoder took down Angela Hill twice. And that's a, a pretty big red flag to me because Ashley Yoder couldn't get down the Adam Way and Jin Yu Fry last week. Ashley Yoder went like 0 for 8 on takedowns against against Jin Yu Fry, but she's going out here and taking down Angela Hill twice. Um, so I think it's simple as that. I think it's going to look very similar to the first fight um, where Tisha Torres, you know, mixes in a takedown, and I think one takedown is probably, you know, the rest of the round. I don't think Angela Hill has a, a great get-up game. I think Tisha Torres can take her down, you know, get minutes of top control and uh, cruise to a decision here. I think the fight will be competitive for sure. I think the striking will be very, very close, but I think Tisha Torres, you know, mixing the takedowns, uh, pushing Hill in the clinch, uh, pushing her against the cage, and just controlling her and winning the fight that way. So I'll take Tisha Torres to win. I'll take her to win by decision. 
All right, next we have my personal favorite fight on the card. We have Vicente Luque going against Michael Chiesa. We have Vicente Luque, who is 29 years old, 5'11", 76-inch reach, 27-1, and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. Michael Chiesa, 33 years old, 6'1", 75-and-a-half-inch reach, 18-4, and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. We have Vicente Luque opening up a minus 160 favorite, currently minus 117. Michael Chiesa opening up plus 140 and currently plus 103 or minus 103. So the line is definitely closing here and, and, and for a very good reason. I think it's a very close fight, a very interesting fight to break down as well. Um, but I do want to get into some of the stats for this fight, though. So Vicente Luque is somebody that's very, very high volume. Um, he lands 5.74 significant strikes per minute with a 54% accuracy. He does absorb 5.78 Significant strikes per minute with a negative significant strike differential of uh, 0.04 with a 52% striking defense. This is a guy that is extremely hittable. He has no striking defense. He relies on his chin, and he is you know one of the guy, one of the very few guys that can rely on his chin because he has um, one of the best chins, if not the best chin in the UFC. This is somebody that in 28 fights he's never been knocked out, and I am convinced that he never will be knocked out. This guy has a chin of steel. So. And especially in this match, like Michael Chiesa is not going to give him problems in the strike. He's not going to, you know, knock him out or hit him much. So um, not much to worry about there. But Michael Chiesa does land 1.89 significant strikes per minute, a lot lower volume, 40% accuracy. But he does absorb 1.71. So he's not getting hit a ton. He does have a positive significant strike differential of 0.18 and a 54% striking defense. Obviously, you favor Luke in the striking. If it is at range, you got to favor Luke there and you got to favor him there all day. So we'll get to the grappling stats. So, and this is where, is where I think the most important aspect of the fight is, is going to be the grappling because that's where um, the majority of Chiesa's fights do play out is in the grappling. And he does average 3.6 takedowns for 15 minutes with a 52% accuracy. Very good wrestler. Um, he does have a 68% takedown defense. As far as Luke, I don't really see him going for takedowns here. Does average half a takedown, 50% accuracy. And he does have a 65% takedown defense. So something I, I really want to point out in terms of some of the numbers for Chiesa's fights. Like, Chiesa, if, if this fight's at range, right, like, Luque is going to win it all day. The problem is, Michael Chiesa does not give his, uh, his opponents opportunities to really hit him. Like, listen to this. Magni, Neil Magni, in a 25-minute fight, Neil Magni lands 12 significant strikes. Think about that. Against Rafael Dos Anjos in a 15-minute in a fight, RDA lands 14 significant strikes. Against Diego Sanchez in a 15-minute fight, Diego Sanchez lands 7 significant strikes. Carlos Conda in a fight that went to the second round, 5. Um, Anthony Pettis in a fight that went to the second round, 9. Um, Kevin Lee, uh, 22. Benil Dariush in a fight that went to the second round, 27. Jim Miller in a fight that went late into the second round, 7. So what I'm trying to get at is... Can Vicente Luque knock him out? Absolutely. It's just, will he get the opportunity to knock him out? And shout out to Uncle Weezy for this, because I think this is big, a big point here. Um, he did it on his breakdown and, and said he went he went fight by fight, and he actually timed how long it took Michael Chiesa to shoot in for a takedown. He went fight by fight. I believe he did like the last seven or eight fights, and it was like 15 seconds in the Magni fight, you know, 15 seconds in the RDA fight, um, you know, 20 seconds in the Diego Sanchez fight. You know, point is... He's going to he's going for takedowns right away. He knows what his strengths are. He knows what his weaknesses are, and he doesn't mess around on the feet. So, um, with that said, I, I think it's a really winnable matchup for Michael Chiesa. You take a look at Vicente Luque, and you kind of look through his record. He's not really fighting guys that are going to want to take him down. Like Tyron Woodley doesn't really want to take anybody down. Randy Brown took him down once. Uh, Nico Price took him down once. Obviously, Stephen Thompson's not going to want to take it down. Mike Perry, for the most part, uh, Derek Krantz took him down once. Actually, took his back. Um, he was able to get out of that and knock him out, but still, getting your back taken by Derek Krantz, not a good look. After that, you know, Brian Barberain is not going to take you down. Jalen Turner is not going to take you down. Price again. Edwards took him down three times and controlled him. Um, after that, you know, Michael Graves on the Ultimate Fighter took him down seven times. Um, so basically what I'm getting at is he can be taken down. He can be controlled, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen here with Michael Chiesa. Uh, Michael Chiesa, since coming up to 170, has been looking phenomenal. I have no clue how he made 155. He's even big at 170. He's going to have a, a height advantage here. He's going to be the bigger fighter. Um, and I think he can win this fight. Like I think Luke is very finish dependent. I think for Luke to win, it's going to be a knockout. Which, like I brought up the, all the points, that he's not going to have a you know really an opportunity to do that much or get a submission. Which I think if Luke does win, honestly, I think it's probably by submission. Chiesa has been submitted three times in his career. Luke, very very underrated grappler, very legit grappler in Luke. So 
If Luke does win, I, I personally think it will be a sub because the fight's going to play out on the mat for the majority of the fight. But as long as Chiaz is able to stay safe on top, I do think he grinds out a decision here. So if you like Luke, man, like take Luke inside the distance, which by the way, that line's pretty crazy, but that's how he wins. I don't see Luke winning a decision here. I'd be highly shocked if he did. I think Luke is finish or bust. I will take the guy that I think is going to win minutes in Michael Chiesa. And um, yeah, basically, I'm looking forward to this fight. I'm really looking forward to this fight. My favorite fight on the card. Luke is actually one of my favorite fighters. I love this guy. I love his style. I love how he's a, he's a warrior. You know, he goes in there. He goes in. And he gets into wars. He does it for the fans. And you know, he loves fighting. And uh, he's my he's one of my favorite fighters. He's awesome. But I think it's a very winnable matchup for Michael Chiesa here. So I'll take Chiesa to win. I'll take him as a dog, and I'll take him by decision. All right, time for the co-main event. We have Jose Aldo going against Pedro Munoz. We have uh, Aldo, who is 34 years old, 5'7", 70-inch reach, 29-7, and seven and 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Munoz, 34 years old as well, 5'6", 65-inch reach, 19-5, and five and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. I know, you're, I know what you're thinking. I thought it as well. How are these guys the same age? 34 years old apiece. Um, when you think of Munoz, you think he's probably a lot younger. You think of Aldo, you think he's probably a lot older. Um, that's because Aldo has been fighting, I think, for like three or four more years than Munoz. So, you know, Munoz is younger in terms of fight years. Um, he's younger in terms of, you know, the amount of, you know, fights on his record as well. And, um, I think their birthday is like two days apart as well, which is just insane. Um, but as far as this fight goes, I do want to get into the stats. Before we do, I do want to check out the line here. And it should be close because this is a close fight. This is a very close fight. Jose Aldo open up as a minus 130 favorite, currently minus 116. Minos opening up plus 110, currently minus 104. Yeah, lots of very close fights on this card, and this is definitely one of them. I think this is probably... One of the toughest fights to call on the card. Um, I do want to get into the stats here as I do think they're very important though. So uh, Pedro Munoz does land 5.6 significant strikes per minute with a 43% accuracy. But listen to this, he absorbs 5.87 significant strikes per minute. This guy absorbs a ton of significant strikes with a negative 0.27 significant strike differential and a 58% striking defense. Um, so yeah, you know Pedro Munoz is very, very high volume, but he's also very, very hittable as well. As far as Jose Aldo, a lot lower volume. Uh, lands 3.45 significant strikes per minute with a 45% accuracy. Does absorb 3.52 uh, with a, a negative significant strike differential himself, but a 61% striking defense. As far as the grappling stats, I don't think we need to get into it much. Jose Aldo, a 91% takedown defense. Some of the best takedown defense you'll ever see. Um... Munoz doesn't really go for takedowns much as well with only uh, landing about half a takedown for 15 minutes, only a 21% accuracy. So I do expect this fight to play out on the feet. Um, I'd be kind of surprised if it did go down to the mat. As far as how they do finish fights, uh, Jose Aldo has a 62% finish rate, 59% coming by knockout. Uh, Pedro Munoz does have a 68% finish rate, 47% coming by submission. Uh, Munoz in 24 fights, he's never been knocked out. And he's never been submitted. This guy is very, very durable. I think that's very important. As far as Jose Aldo, he has been finished in five of his seven losses, four by knockout, and one by submission. So, yeah, to, to sum it up and to break it down, it's a, it's a close fight. Um, do you lean on you know the volume of Pedro Munoz landing 5.6 significant strikes per minute, or do you lean on... You know, probably landing the harder shots and, and Jose Aldo, a 70-inch reach. He's going to have a 5-inch reach advantage. Um, for me, I'm, I'm personally leaning towards the volume side of things with Munoz. I think it's going to be a very close and a very competitive fight. But you take a look at Jose Aldo and it just not really high volume. I mean, against Marlon Vera, only 44 significant strikes. Against Piotr Jan, 83 significant strikes that went to the fifth round. Against Marlon Marias, 58 significant strikes. Uh, Volkanovski, 29 significant strikes. Moicano, 26 in a fight that went to the second round. So you just see that like he's not very high volume at all, where you, as you have Pedro Munoz, you know, landing 94 against Rivera, landing 166 against Edgar, landing 105 against Sterling. You know, he's just landing a lot more. So I do think Munoz is going to out-volume Jose Aldo. I think he has a chin to take some shots as well. And I'm going to say that Munoz does win this fight by decision. So taking uh, another dog there in Pedro Munoz by decision. All right, next we have the main event. We have the interim heavyweight championship. Not really going to get into uh, my thoughts on, on this fight and, and the whole championship thing. But uh, it's, it's a fight, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to this fight. Should be fun to an extent, or it could be boring. 
But regardless, Derek Lewis, he is a fan favorite. Um, people love the guy. I'm a big fan of him as well. You have Cyril Gaon, who people are very, very high on, and, and for a very good reason. Um, so me and Uncle Weezy did a main event deep dive on my channel on Monday. If you guys have not checked that out, go check it out. We go very into depth on this fight, but I'll kind of sum it up here. So we'll start with the tail of the tape. Uh, Derek Lewis is 36 years old, six foot three, 79 inch reach, 25 and seven, four and one in his last five fights. Cyril Gaon, 31 years old, six foot four, 83 inch reach, nine and zero. Obviously five and zero in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. And Gone is the biggest favorite on the entire card, and I can't really disagree. Uh, Gone open at minus. 325 currently minus 375 Derek Lewis opening up plus 275 and currently plus 300 so we'll get into the stats here um as I think they're kind of important so gone does land 5.13 significant strikes per minute with a 54 percent accuracy absorbing only 2.6 significant strikes per minute with a positive 2.53 significant strike differential and a 63 percent striking defense those numbers are dominant those are very very dominant striking numbers a a, a positive 2.53 Significant strike differential. Landing over half the amount of significant strikes as his opponents. Dominant. As far as Derek Lewis, a little bit more low volume. Um, does land 2.59 significant strikes per minute with a 50% accuracy. But does absorb only 2.16. So he's not getting hit much. Um, with a positive 0.43 significant strike differential. But he does have a 44% striking defense. So you know definitely there to be hit. Um, as far as the grappling stats go... This is where it gets kind of interesting. I don't know if Gon's going to want to go down to the down to the mat here with Lewis. Um, I think he absolutely can. He tried to take Rosenstruck down 14 times, was able to get him down uh, twice. But if he wants to get Lewis down to the mat, he, he absolutely can here. Um, Derek Lewis, a 54% takedown defense. Gon does average about a takedown for 15 minutes with a 21% accuracy. And Derek Lewis does, you know, struggle with getting taken down. Um, he's been taken down in a ton of fights. Um... Not the Curtis Blades fight, not the Curtis Blades fight, because Curtis Blades uh, waited way too long to get a t go for a takedown, and when he did, um, that uppercut that knocked him out, and that's that's kind of Derek Lewis's style. I mean, he's somebody that's going to be losing fights up until he, he wins. Um, Curtis Blades was outlanding him clearly 28-7, um, to 7, and then Lewis lands that, that big shot. Um, he lands seven strikes in, 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 in six minutes and 26 seconds. Um... You know, against Alir Latifi, he gets taken down three times. You know, Alexei Galenik takes him down once. Blagoy Ivanov takes him down three times. Cormier, four. Volkov takes him down. Tibera takes him down. Um, Shamil Abdurkhimov takes him down four times. Roy Nelson, seven times. It goes on and on and on. If you want to get Derek Lewis down, you can. Um, it's just we saw, you know, Derek Lewis's takedown defense is now a, a nasty uppercut. So, and even then, like, I don't think Gon needs to go for a takedown to win this fight. I think Gon could just stay on the outside for 25 minutes and, and win a pretty clear cut decision or maybe even finish Lewis as well. It's a pretty simple fight to break down, as are, you know, most Derek Lewis fights. I, I pick against this guy quite a bit, and he tends to surprise us, surprise everybody. Like, against Curtis Blades, like, I was very. Um, confident in Curtis Blades, thinking he'd go for the takedowns early and often, and he lands a hard shot against, you know, Alexander Volkov. He gets um, a beat for every single second of that fight up until the last couple seconds and, and gets a knockout, and that's just how Derek Lewis is. He's going to be losing the fight up until he's not, and that's what kind of makes it dangerous of, you know, putting gone minus 400 in your parlays because it, it takes one little mistake, one little slip up, one shot of Derek Lewis, and gone's lights can be put out, but what I like about Gon is he's very athletic, he's very fast, he manages a range very well, so I don't think he's going to give Lewis many opportunities to find that knockout shot. On top of that, you know, a lot of people, you know, call him a boring fighter. I call him a smart fighter. Against Rosenstrug, everybody was saying that that fight was boring. I was impressed. Yes, it was yes, it was boring, but he stayed safe. He had a he had a murderous power puncher right in front of him, and he kind of stayed on the outside for 25 minutes and won a decision. And I kind of see that happening here. It's just I don't know if he finishes Lewis, because you know, Gone is somebody that he lets the finish come to him. He's not gonna go out of his way. He's not gonna get in a firefight with Derek Lewis. He's not gonna stand in the middle and bang. Um, if the finish comes to him, he'll get the finish, but he's not like a like a murderous power puncher where it's gonna be one shot and Derek Lewis is out. Uh, but Derek Lewis has been finishing all five of his UFC losses, uh, four coming by knockout, one coming by submission. So I think a gone finish is, is definitely possible. Um, you know what? I will say I'll say he does finish Lewis. I'll say it's like a, a late finish, though. I think it's going to be fourth round. I'll say fourth round KO for Cyril Gaon. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know one of those fights where Gaon should absolutely win. 
I think if he does win, he'll, he'll look minus 1,000 or more. But Lewis has that X factor, and that's that power. And would it be shocked if Darius Lewis, Derek Lewis knocked out Gon? No, I would not. Derek Lewis can knock out anybody on the planet. So, but you got to go with Gon, right? You got to go with Gon. He's the, he's the much better fighter. I'm not a, a, a big fan of the skill set of Derek Lewis. I think he's good at one thing, and that's that's hitting hard. But yeah, Gon should, Gon should win this fight for the, the majority of the time. So, I'll take Cyril Gon for the win. All right, we broke it down. Thank you so much. If you guys are still here, hit the like. That'd be much, much appreciated. Let's try to get that 500 likes, maybe 600, if that'd be possible as well. Um, do want to remind you guys about the Patreon. I do have six bets thus far. Looking at a couple more. Um, the matchup template and advanced stats are already out. Um, and then the article will be out very soon. I've been getting the article out like earlier, like Wednesday now. So lots of good stuff coming. Um, check out the live stream Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Last week was a mess at the weigh-ins so i definitely encourage you to check out the a the weigh-ins and b my live stream on friday and then also going live one hour prior to the prelims on saturday so that's about it guys thank you always so much for your support week in and week out time to bounce back from the disaster of last week um you don't need to comment down that i that i did bad i already know i already know people have already told me and uh looking forward to this card looking forward to bouncing back and in a very big way as well in a very big way as well. So um, that's about it, guys. You guys are awesome. Good luck, and we will talk to you very soon. See ya.